I could see based on somebody's blood test, like what their pace of aging is basically, how healthy they are. Even if you're very healthy, you still want to optimize and see what you can do. Like I said, I look at a lot of people's labs. It's very clear to me that you're... Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. I'm your host Seam Lund, and today we're talking with Joe Cohen. Joe is the founder and CEO of Self Decode, which is a genetics analysis company. In this episode, we're going to look at my own recent blood work I did at my retreat in India. Based on the Self Decode analysis, my blood work is 97 out of 100. Self Decode has hundreds of reports for various issues like low mood, heart disease, fat loss, sleep, etc. Based on your blood work and genetics, Self Decode will then list science based recommendations for supplements, foods, and lifestyle. If you want to get your DNA tested or let Self Decode automatically analyze your blood work, then head over to selfdecode.com and use the code SEAM for a 10% discount. Yo, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to have you back. And we just came back maybe like a few weeks ago already from uh, our retreat in India. We did a uh, blood test there, pretty comprehensive one, over 180 biomarkers, plus like 35 amino acids from the urine. So yeah, we both got a pretty good like uh, overview of our biomarkers while at the retreat. And in this episode, we're just going to share my results, talk about my results, and uh, also like uh, look at it from... How, how do you like get a very good scientific and evidence-based overview of whatever biomarkers you have with the self decode uh, website where you can upload your genetics plus your blood work and get yeah like like AI based and evidence-based uh, recommendations uh, for those results so yeah I'm glad to uh, speak with you awesome yeah likewise uh, great speaking to you and uh, I just like to start with um, you have great blood results so you know how there's a test for aging epigenetic tests i could see based on somebody's lab test if they're going to get a good result on these because basically what they're doing is they're taking these kinds of markers maybe some other ones but a lot of them are just based on regular blood tests and i could see based on somebody's blood test if they're going like what their pace of aging is basically how healthy they are and uh in your case in particular something that is very interesting is that during the test, I could see based on a bunch of blood markers that you were fighting an infection. However, you mentioned that you didn't have any symptoms of an infection, and that's because you're very resilient. So um, I remember you did some kind of test like a, the VO2 max test, and you said you were traveling, you, you weren't, you know, you, you weren't 100 uh, percent on your game normally. You thought it was because of the travel. Actually, you were fighting an infection. Mm, right and the fact that you didn't experience any symptoms just speaks about your resilience meaning people usually get an infection they start having a whole bunch of symptoms you're able to fight it off and not have inflammation your hscrp was still very low so normally you know there's a lot of ways the body fights an, an infection and you don't you can't really prevent infection so much right because if you're breathing air in an environment that's not outside, like if you're traveling on an airplane, there's like 300 people or whatnot. People are breathing on you. They're coughing. And in this season, where I am at least, everybody's getting sick all the time. And I check my blood markers all the time. And I say, yeah, I, I'm also getting sick, but I'm not having any significant symptoms. Like I might feel a little weaker or whatever, but nothing... I get over it pretty quickly. And so it's not about whether you get the infection or not. I mean, if you don't want to get an infection, you have to stay isolated, mm. right? But if you're, <laughs> you got to be in a bubble room. Right. But if in if it's in the winter, you're traveling, especially internationally, you will likely get infections. And then the question is, how do you cope with the infection? You, you know, you might not have felt it just because you're so robust. But I can see it very clearly on the blood test. Now, a lot of the blood tests that are just measuring like inflammation, those were pretty low because those aren't the first line response. Your body has a lot more robust responses before that. If you have like a lot of inflammation after infection, that already means that you're starting to feel symptoms and things like mm -hmm. that. But right. the first line is actually the amino acids. So your body knows it has an infection and starts sucking up all the amino acids from the blood. Mm. 
and and because you did you did an amino acid test before, we could see okay here is a baseline, and we could see what happens with those amino acids when you get an infection. And by the way, the same thing happened to me. I got an infection. I'm very in tune with my body. I didn't have any significant symptoms, but I felt a little weaker, and I I just thought okay. Um, I did a blood test the next day because I love to see what's going on. Same thing, all my amino, like a lot of my amino acids were low. And my inflammation was still pretty low. So it, it was a similar kind of situation that we both had. But the idea is that you're getting infections, but you're fighting them off well. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, exercise also raises or causes oxidative stress and inflammation. It's not, not about, you know, getting infected or getting <laughs> exposed to these kinds of stressors is yeah like the resilience aspect of you know not being wiped out or not getting uh, the symptoms is what is more important yeah uh, they're respiratory infections usually and so mm. if you're breathing in air and you're you're not outside all day you're going to get them and then it's yeah. just a question of how how well you fight them yeah so uh yeah we can just maybe jump into my results and you can share the screen of the self decode okay. dashboard uh, i gave access to my results uh, to your account so you can just uh, walk us through of you know how does the self decode work uh, okay. how can people like upload the results and yeah what my results uh, are yeah so i'll just take it back a little bit what self decode provides is so our core technology is actually on polygenic risk scoring and we're you know we're just submitting a paper now showing that it's the the most accurate polygenic risk scoring in the world um when you have a lot of these genetic companies, there's usually a new genetic company every day. The problem is, is that what they're doing is they're just taking SNPs online, which any monkey could do, you know, and they're putting it in a PDF format and they're saying, okay, if you have this SNP, then do that. And if you have that SNP, do that. The problem is this is a hundred million SNPs. And the only way to really make sense of it for any kind of predictive power is to use AI and machine learning, right? Because it's, it's a data problem. There's too much data you can't have a human selecting some SNPs from PubMed. Right. And and we tried that just to see. We, we compared it to, we have biobanks of 2 million people. And we saw, you know, can this predict anything? And it's usually just either a coin flip or not, you know, very, very slightly. Depends on what, but usually not predictive at all. And so that's why we spend tons of money like $20 million building a comprehensive platform and the technology for polygenic risk scoring so that not only we could do it, other companies can do it as well if they want to incorporate this polygenic risk scoring. But, you know, it's it's really a, a travesty that every day there's a new company coming out. People ask me, what do you think of this test? And I just look at it right away. I say, okay, look, they're looking at 100 SNPs. You can't tell anything from this. There's no sophisticated analysis. They're just, you know, plusing and minus some variants together. So that's kind of self-decode the core technology. But then on top of that, in order to get personalized recommendations from that, you really have to combine other types of data. That's why I told you, fill out your symptoms, conditions, and goals, right? You don't really have any uh, significant symptoms as I'm, uh, or conditions, as I'm aware, but um, I don't know of any, but uh, you have some goals, whether it's longevity or whatever it is, so you can you can fill out or fitness, exercise recovery, injury recovery. Anybody who works out is going to get injuries if you do a lot of workouts. So um, you want to match those up with your goals. And then also you want to match them up with your genetic risk, polygenetic risk. So we, we have like 500 different polygenic scores and we could see what you're at highest risk for. And we can match those up with your genetics in combination with your symptoms, conditions and goals, as well as your lab tests and lifestyle risks. So the lifestyle risk is where you fill out questionnaires. And, and those are kind of the gaps between the lab tests, the genetics, and your symptoms and conditions. Because it's something like if you have a family history of cancer, we can get that from the lifestyle analyzer, right? And we can combine all that information together. Um, you know, and also if you, you know, if you smoke or drink or how much you exercise and what your diet's like, there's known risk factors for different things like obesity. So you fill out certain questions and we could see what your risk is for different conditions that isn't just based on a lab test or genetics. And so in order to get recommendations, you really have to combine those. And then we have an added layer where we take variants that have decent evidence from the literature that says, okay, maybe this is even more helpful 
because of this genetic variant, but that's not even the strongest thing. It's really the combination of all six arenas where, and, and you want to see, so whenever I take a supplement now, the first thing I do is I look it up and see, number one is, where does this rank in terms of the recommendations? What number is this? And how does this help me? And everything has references, so you could see the whole thing. And, and how does this help my labs? How does this help my everything? So we're going to go through that with you, see which recommendations overall are going to give you the best bang for your buck. But also, first, I think we're just going to look at your labs, do a scan of the labs and, and show you what, uh, you know, what, what you can optimize. Like I said, I look at a lot of people, a lot of people's labs. I could see how healthy they are. It's very clear to me that you're extremely healthy. So, and I would say on average, maybe one out of three labs or more, maybe sometimes, you know, it's, it's a rain, maybe, maybe anywhere between 10% and 50% of the labs are going to be out of the optimal range. Right. Yeah, could yeah. even be more, it could be, you know, if somebody's really unhealthy, it could be like 90%, right? But the idea is everybody's going to have labs out of the optimal range. And even if you're very healthy and the idea is you, you still want to optimize and, and see what you can do, even if you feel great, these things can be still good in the long run by reducing the risk of disease. And, and so you can compare different things, you know, and, and, and again, there's also sometimes like, you know, HSCRP, you have extremely low levels of inflammation of 0 0.2, but it, you, you know, somebody could still have, let's say one and they think, okay, well, I'm normal. You you still want to optimize as much as possible, yeah. and yeah, so like getting, we're gonna getting to yeah. the getting to the like the lowest mortality range, based on the kind of yeah. studies. So mo almost most of these markers, when we have optimal ranges, they usually have a study on all cause mortality, and what you want to look at is what level has the lowest all cause mortality, right? And Sometimes you'll be in the suboptimal range, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because they're not always, these studies aren't always causal. It's not clear right. that there's a very clear causal link between the, the two things. Um, you still want to be in the optimal range. I find that even if it's not causal a lot of times, it's still indicative of something that you can do better usually. Um, sometimes not, but still you, you want to have it on your radar and for me, the goal is to have every marker that's optimal all the time, yeah. right? Except when you're maybe fighting infection, there's going to be a few that uh, are changing. So we're looking at the lab result now. Uh, the best way to do it is to look at previous results. I didn't upload. I didn't get a chance to upload your previous result. I don't have access to it. That's better, but um, we could still look at your current result. I did upload your previous amino acid results because I had those. And... Um, and I and we're gonna look at you know and, and I'll show you why it's important to upload multiple examples. Uh, and so I'll, I'll I'll share my screen now. And just to be clear, a lot of your amino acids were going to be out of the optimal range simply because you were fighting an infection, which happened to me as well. But I also made sure to upload uh, the previous results so that we could see what your result was when you were not fighting an infection. And so we're going to start with citrulline right now. So citrulline like for the reference, is... this new test was in February and this is the earlier test we did in November in the same uh, India retreat. So it's uh, correct. Three, three, four month uh, gap between the two. Correct. And you have, um, we also have the dates here. So you see yeah. February 5th here and November 8th here to 2023. Yeah. So we, we're going to start looking at citrulline, and what we see is this is one of the amino acids. When you get an infection, your body uses the hell out of citrulline to create nitric oxide, and it's, it's part of the immune response uh, to fight off infections. And so, you know, the normal range is 16 to 51 here. There's no all-cause mortality on it, but the interesting thing about citrulline is it, it is related to gut function. So... You want this to be in at least the normal range because it's going to help with leaky gut, IBD. Uh, it looks like I don't think we have an optimal range for this. No, we don't because there's no all-cause mortality, but you still want it. You don't necessarily want to be on the low end. And here you're below normal because you're fighting that infection. So what that means is even though 
it's not relevant for you day to day. What that means is if you are fighting an infection or you f- you're traveling, it makes sense to take more citrulline. Mm. And one of the things to un- understand is for different reasons, everybody has a tendency for more or less amino acids. We, we have some of those genetic tendencies this, this, uh, in self-decode. The studies aren't usually great with the amino acids because there's not that many people, but essentially... Uh, what you want to do is everyone has a tendency to have higher or lower levels of certain amino acids. I see it all the time and it could be for many reasons, but if you're low on something or if you're on the lower end and you see it going lower in infection, it's something you want to be mindful of when you're fighting an infection. And that's, and that's what I do as well. And something I'll, I'll show you a little later, but if we look at something like valine, So actually, um, oh, this was, I want to see your, uh, is this right? So there's, I see, I don't, maybe, um, I don't know if I uploaded the other valine, but I'm, I'm going to check it now on your test here. So your new valine, let's see what's, what's not, Oops. your new valine is 106.7. So that's what we need to change here. This is 106. I just got the date wrong here but okay so the 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 reason why we have an optimal range for valine is because studies show that the higher the the valine is related to um longevity having higher levels of valine is related to longevity and so it's something that we don't know the exact number because the studies aren't done showing the exact number in in these specific cases, I picked a somewhat random, like just a, a number based on what I saw as normal in, in healthy people. And I use that as the optimal range. Um, in, in your case, and, and for some reason, I genetically have higher levels of valine. Like it's just something that is usually pretty good in my uh, blood test. In your case, you seem to have a tendency for lower valine. So even in a normal state, this was one of the only amino acids in a normal state that you had lower levels of. And this is related to longevity. So Mm -hmm. it's something that, and then it went down even more when you were fighting an infection, but it's something you want higher levels of. Uh, For some reason, you're you're taking up more valine. um, And it's, and again, it's, is it proven that valine uh, causes longevity? No, but there's multiple studies showing that higher levels of valine, it's a metabolite in the blood that, that is associated with longevity. So this is an example of something that I think you should probably supplement with. You don't necessarily want the whole BCAA, branch chain amino acid, because that's also going to have isoleucine, and isoleucine is bad for longevity. <laughs> right. So you're basically getting a mixed bag of and and I actually bought valine by its own just for when I'm uh fighting an infection. Um but let's go back to so that's valine. Citrulline again is normal normally, but during an infection, phenylalanine went down during the infection, but it was normal regularly. Um that is also there's one study that shows it's related to uh well it's it's actually it's not there's contradicting evidence for phenylalanine. You kind of want it in the normal range. Uh, just it, having too much is actually not good for longevity, but uh, you want it in the normal range because it's going to help you with a whole bunch of things. It's it's an essential amino acid, so that's kind of just one that you want in the normal range, which is good in a normal state. Mm-hmm. Then we go to ornithine. So normally you're high on ornithine. This is not necessarily a bad thing. I have high ornithine as well. It's really just related to exercise. So when you're exercising a lot, you're creating a lot of ornithine. Right. Um, and 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 it's not a bad thing. It's just uh, both me Light and you effects. have it. This yeah. There's no studies on all cause mortality in ornithine, and and you know it's a lot of people use it as a supplement for helping exercise and recovery and things like that. So it's a natural response by the body to increase ornithine when you're exercising. It might be related to something if it's too high uh, a lot, you might be thinking more of maybe I should be getting more recovery. But given that we only have one result, it's I wouldn't say it's it's very relevant. But when you fought the infection, you used the shit out of it. Right. <laughs> so, so then it went low. 
Um, again, that's not a bad thing. So every, you know, we're, we're just giving the normal range when we don't have an optimal range. If you're high, it doesn't, it's not something that uh, you need to worry about. It's just something that we have to flag in the system so that you're aware of it. Alanine is something that um, you don't want to have high levels of. It's not a longevity amino acid, as I like to call it. Uh, it's kind of it's it's got its pros and cons. You want it to be in the optimal in the normal range, and your alanine levels went lower during the infection, but was normal regularly. So so far, you know, like I said, all the amino acids you're actually pretty good on, except for valine. That was the only one that was consistently on the lower end whether you had an infection or not, and went a little lower with the infection. Asparagine is a longevity amino acid. Um, so that's something that you can get from food. It it also, you can create it in, in, in the system. Um, but essentially, uh, yeah, that, that also went down during the infection, was normal regularly. It is something that is related to longevity, as I mentioned. So you you kind of want to have a little bit higher levels. You could see the normal is 31 to 92, but here we have an optimal range because it's related to longevity. And you're in the optimal. And we're uh, so I'm just going to go we're going I want to just go through all the amino acids that are relevant in your tests just so we can, you know, cut it up like okay, now we're just doing amino acids. Um the arginine Arginine, you use a lot of when you have an infection. Uh, there isn't any all-cause mortality from arginine, and there's a very wide range for arginine, so between 32 and 407. Uh, I think it's usually better to have a little bit higher levels of arginine. So there is data on the arginine to ornithine ratio, whereas you want to have a higher arginine to ornithine. So if you look at your arginine here, it's 50, and your ornithine back then was was 141 so that's not a great ratio um so that there is some data on but um you know by itself each one is fine and arginine is used to create ornithine just fyi um so it's used to create ornithine and citrulline and uh, again so this one you use you use up a lot in an infection and again all this stuff is is very normal it means your your, your body's working normally so just seeing that this is out just again just means that it's it's very interesting so that the way to the way to take this information is that when you're fighting an infection you want all of these amino acids um and and you don't want to take them separately except let's say arginine like alanine and phenylalanine you could just increase your total protein intake from whey or whatever it is and you're going to get those essential um th those amino acids I don't think alanine is essential um, citrulline and arginine, you could take a little extra, or you could just take arginine. It'll help convert to citrulline. And then leucine is also a culprit that goes down during infections. And again, I'm, I look at my results as well. They, all these, the same one, very similar ones went down during infections, um, in different amounts, but they, they also, they went in the same direction. And so you have leucine here went under the normal range at 65 and then Normally, you're in the optimal. Leucine is associated with more, um, longevity, actually. Having a little bit higher levels of leucine is important for longevity. Not every study agrees with that, but most do. That The, the, the best studies uh, say that you, you want to have higher levels of leucine. Now, let's go to some other amino acids. We got proline also went down. I would say that you're a little bit lower on the proline normally. So... Um, it's something you want to be careful of. I did a, a lot of experiments with proline because I was also on the lower end a little bit. And the problem with supplementing proline is that it converts into glutamate. <laughs> if you take a lot of proline, then you, I, I was, you know, I was taking a lot of proline and AKG both convert to glutamate and I started to get anxiety from it. And it was interesting to induce anxiety from glutamate uh, based on these experiments but it isn't something that you want to uh, just take willy nilly. I think it, you know you can try it out and see, but uh, it is something that increases glutamate. And so now I'm, um, I think it's better to increase the conversion from glutamate to proline instead of to try to get more proline.
but anyway, that that goes down. Proline is important for collagen production. That went down during the infection. We spoke about valine. N-methyl 3, methyl histidine is really, I also have high levels. It really just means that uh, it's from exercise. So it's normal that it's going to go up. And again, it could be a marker. If it's too high, it could be a, a marker for maybe you need more recovery or or you know, there, there's certain things you could take for recovery. In your case, I don't think it's high enough to do anything about it. It's just, it's it's very normal uh, given that you're you're physically fit. Hydroxyproline is related to vitamin C actually. So there's no clear uh, optimal range for this. It's just that I looked at a bunch of people's results and I saw that, you know, basically you're converting proline to hydroxyproline and you need vitamin C for that reaction. So it could either be that you're just lower on proline or it could be that you need more vitamin C. And in, um, in, in this case, it was, you know, both situations. So it, it's something that my, the next step I would say is doing a serum uh, test for vitamin C and seeing what your vitamin C levels are. And by the way, it's not so um, obvious that if you're just eating a lot of vegetables or whatever, or you're very healthy, that your serum levels are going to be high. Um, mine weren't actually that great, <laughs> my serum levels of vitamin C. And I, and I was taking 1,500 milligrams a day, so now I'm even taking more. Um, and same with the hydroxylysine. This is a reaction that needs vitamin C. So the hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine are a little lower. And, and during the normal state, you're fine with hydroxylysine, but during the infection, it went down. And that kind of, and that makes sense. Um, histidine is a longevity amino acid. And again, we, we, uh, I picked an arbitrary optimal range for this a little bit just because there's a lot of studies that show it's related to longevity. And I found that I had better performance and, and, you know, um, with higher levels as well. So this is something you could think about supplementing if you want to get your levels up. This is very responsive to supplements. Most of these, almost all of them are very responsive to supplements, by the way. Uh, I would say proline was a little less so. So me taking a lot of proline didn't increase my proline levels that much. It more like increased my glutamate. So that's something that you're not really going to understand beforehand from any scientific study. It was just me taking copious amounts of proline <laughs> and seeing what happened. Like literally, I took 15 grams of proline in a day. And it was uh, pretty intense, the the anxiety. But um, I actually got rid of the anxiety by re reducing glutamate. So it was pretty quick. You know, the anxiety came, but I was able to reduce it. It was an interesting one. Um, we skipped over. Okay, methionine. This is an interesting one. Um, there was one study that showed that this is related to longevity, which is a little surprising because you know, you would think methionine restriction is related to longevity. But actually, if you look at the metabolite in humans, there was a study uh, showing that it was related to longevity. And by the way, we have the references for everything I'm saying here. So no need to take my word for it. You can uh, just look them up on the site. And each, each, um, each of these things has its own page showing what the uh, information is. But you can in click terms on it of or show it for a moment. Huh? You can click and show it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we we were very clear about usually it's related to mortality risk, but it's what we say is research currently available does not directly relate methionine levels to mortality risk, meaning there's no specific range that we have. However, higher levels of this amino acid are associated with longer lifespan in the serum, right? In the blood. So, and then we say that, you know, it's, we're, you know, we're, we're keeping an eye on this to make sure it's updated in the future, but here's the uh, study. So, um, and again, we could go to any one that you're interested in and, and look at, um, look at that information, but you could see here, these are the metabolites and you could see the hazard ratio 0 0.93. That means the higher the methionine, the lower the risk. You could see valine as well here. 0.92, this is the hazard ratio. So um, leucine, tryptophan, histidine, lysine, and methionine, like I said, there was one study. For the other ones, there's multiple studies. 
And you could see something like ergothenine, which is a supplement, has lower hazard ratio. Um, and let's see. Yeah, so this is also a graph that shows like things on this side is related to longevity. These metabolites, you see methionine over here. And things on this side are related to worse longevity, like aging. And you could see isoleucine and glutamate. So those are the two amino acids you don't want high in the serum, isoleucine and glutamate. And uh, the other ones, all these, you know, generally, and again, it's, it's for most of these, there's multiple studies showing that, which is what I like to look for. And methionine, there's one, but I haven't seen any contradictory information on that. So it's the best information we have. And I also look at people's results and I look at my results and see how do I feel when I increase my methionine? And and I actually don't increase my methionine with taking methionine, by the way. Uh, you could see, um, yeah, so I increase my methionine. There's also recommendations for all these uh, tests, by the way. But I increase my methionine levels uh, actually by taking MSM. So my methionine levels... Uh, at the baseline, one second, were 14, which was lower than yours actually, right? So it was around 13, 12 to 14. And it's basically a measure of, uh, you know, it, it helps you understand how much methylation you have. And if you're, if you're exercising a lot, methionine is, is important for uh, building muscle and recovery and immunity. So in your case, in a healthy state, I would say you're fine. No, nothing to worry about there. Um, basically, like you're right on that borderline. And since it's a somewhat arbitrary number anyway, um, I wouldn't be worried about it. But it's something to think about, right? It's like I, I'm trying to take you through the thought process here where, okay, this is related to longevity. I personally had better results with higher levels. I see people, you know, I see the normal ranges and it goes from all over the place. My methionine levels tripled when I started taking MSM. So uh went from like 12, 13 to, to 36 or something like that. And uh and I found that I was recovering better, not necessarily because of the higher methionine, um, just because of the uh, you know, I think it was the sulfur mainly, um, and, and also had some methyl groups. But the idea is that uh it's interesting to see that. So overall. Uh, let me see if there's any other amino acids. There's threonine. Again, it's normal normally, and it is associated with longevity. And then threonine here was low during the infection or suboptimal. It wasn't low, actually. Uh, tryptophan was suboptimal, almost low during the infection, but normally it's optimal. And this one... This one is an interesting one. This is called ABBA, alpha amino butyric acid. This is one of the, uh, this is something on my list. It's not so clear. Um, so it doesn't directly relate to uh, mortality risk, but higher levels have been associated with longevity, longer lifespan. So again, this is, um, with, with the regular blood test, by the way, there's very clear ranges where you have a population and they tell you this is the range that is the lowest all-cause mortality. With the amino acids, you just know that people who have higher levels, you know, usually within the normal range, but maybe, you know, they're just looking at all levels, are, you know, it's associated with longer lifespan. So that's the only data that we have, unfortunately. And... um yeah, and I find, you know, that when these are higher, I am performing better. Um, and so that's something to uh, look at, look into. It looks like one of them. Uh, let's see. So, so there's one of them that actually, I, I, yeah, so one of them is 18.22. Uh, one second. This is a, uh, this one's okay. Um, but anyway, th those are, uh, I think those are the amino acids that let's see if there's any other amino acids. No, 
that's the amino acid story, which now you understand why I like to check amino acids. So those are the ones that came up as suboptimal or low during the infection. And um, there's, you know, there's a few, mainly the valine is something you want to think about increasing. And then the other ones just during an infection because you have pretty good levels normally. What do you think about all that? Uh, yeah, I mean, very interesting or, you know, most people don't measure the amino acids. <laughs> it's not part of the regular blood panel, so it's definitely... And I haven't like measured my amino acids uh, ever before, so it's very kind of you know interesting to see. Um, but yeah, yeah, I ha I didn't either until I started seeing all these studies on metabolites and Mendelian randomization studies, which you know start to realize like, hey, wait a second, there's something you know important for like there's a lot of important things going on here, and we're not measuring it. The we don't have like specific ranges like we do with normal regular blood tests. But, uh, you know, you could, that's why I'm, I'm, you know, I put something here and we put some information, but, um, yeah, I feel like I found good results personally by getting them all to the optimal range. And one of the things I did was if I start feeling like slightly weak, like an infection is coming on or my body's fighting something, I take a lot of amino acids a lot. And, and I find that, um, yeah, I just recover like like I feel much better after that. And gotcha. and, and again, your body is using all these I mean, normally your body is using amino acids uh so you can be low on amino acids for a few main reasons. One is you're not eating enough protein. One is you're overexercising, so you're not getting the amount of protein based on how much exercising you exercise you're doing. And the other is if you're fighting an infection, your body to create all different kinds of antibodies. It's a very intense, protein-intense uh, process. So your body is using all these uh, amino acids, it, it, and and you're not going to be building muscle as well when you're, you know, if you're fighting an infection. So you want to make sure you got more of these amino acids, especially so you don't, um, your body doesn't break down your muscle tissue and you start even losing muscle to to get those amino acids. That's kind of part of the sick response is your body starts breaking down muscle tissue you start feeling more tired and you you feel like you don't want to exercise because again that would not be evolutionarily um compatible since you need all these amino acids for these other reasons yeah now let's go through uh some of your lab tests and and by the way you could also filter just based on a category if you have a sp specific topic like cognitive gut health energy immunity and it'll filter all the lab tests you took based on those categories and you could see which ones are you know suboptimal for that category so you could see arginine comes up because i did immunity infections it's related to immunity tryptophan histidine these are all related to immunity proline and that makes sense so you could see all the ones that are related to specific topics. So this is the, uh, yeah. So now let's go through some of the lab tests. Um, your cortisol being a little high is just a function, I think, of of the infection. So I wouldn't worry about that, actually. Yeah, there was also, like, I slept like three hours the night before. So I think that was like yeah, so part. Yeah, that's not something. I mean, I, and I'm I'm assuming the time before. This is why it's always important to get it, bef you know, all the results in. So I have all of my results in here, and I could see the whole history before and after, like what's happening when I'm traveling, when I'm sleeping a little, you know, di 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 during different situations. Um, I just remember. I think you said that uh, your previous result was normal. So again, nothing, nothing going on there. Um, your lymphocytes are high a percentage, but this is actually a good thing. This is related to longevity. It's probably a little higher now just because you were, you may have been fighting an infection, but this is one of the markers that they use for phenoage. age. Mm. Um, yeah. So when you have a higher lymphocyte percentage, mine is also usually high. And, and again, it's, it's good for biological age. We just put this number here, 55, like the actual normal range is even closer to like 45, I think. 
I, mm-hmm. I extended it to 55 because the higher, the better. But, you know, if it's a little too high, it's not a bad thing. I just wanted to, you know, to point it out to people. Um, but again, it's not a bad thing at all. It's actually a good thing. And this is related to biological age. So having mm-hmm. good lymph- lymphocyte percentage is very good. So that's probably one of the reasons why um, I don't know what it is normally, but you probably will have higher levels normally as well. Um, your estradiol here is not low. It could be a little higher if you wanted. Like there's different opinions on this. There's kind of pros and cons. Depends on what your goal is. But for like cardiovascular disease, it's which is like what Peter Tia talks about, he likes it up to 50. Mm. He likes it higher. There's not really, I mean, the evidence that we found was mainly 22 to 50. So you're very close to that at 21. And again, you want to look at the previous results because you want to see how you're changing. So it's very good to have all the results in here. Uh, Vitamin K, uh, 0.5 is what we found as the optimal range to two. So you probably need a little more vitamin K. What I do is uh, I also am around the same if I don't take it. So I take it once a week, like the life extension one, and that gets up my vitamin K to the optimal range. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, These are small things, right? But it's just important to point out. You're okay. So this is very interesting. This is not necessarily a bad thing. The thyroid, the T3. Um, The free T3 is, 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 I mean that 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 could be related to the infection as well. We need to see what it's you know what what the history is, but the total T three I find people who are on a somewhat low carb diet they have lower T three. Now I don't see any studies with all cause mortality. Uh, it is on the lower end, and mine sometimes comes on the lower end. Um, what I think it is is that people because so what I try to do is I try to take thyroid hormones to see like T3 to see if I would have more energy or whatever it is, like try to try to just see anything. Um, and I didn't, I found that it wasn't, it didn't improve anything really for me. And so my takeaway is that uh, people who are very healthy sometimes may have, a, might be more sensitive, like the receptors are working better. So they don't need necessarily higher levels. And if you're on a low carb diet, I think, the T3 is going to go down a little bit, but your sensitivity probably goes up. So there's no way to check your sensitivity. That's the problem mm. with this test. But it's something to, you know, keep in your radar and and check over time and see how it changes over time. You kind of want it above 80. But again, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say that if somebody's, I, I see it very often, like almost everybody on a lower carb diet, and uh, it's it could just be that, you know, people are more sensitive. So it's one of those things that uh, since there's no way to check the sensitivity of thyroid hormones, um, I, I think it's just uh, you could look at it and, you know, maybe think, OK, maybe I need some more carbs or whatever. But it's not really going to be uh, that like it's not going to necessarily tell us that much. You your vitamin A is a little lower here. And that could just be also from fighting infection. So you want to check what it is normally, like uh, during that baseline. Your homocysteine is 12.1, which is very normal, especially if you're working out a fair bit and you're not taking supplements. But studies do show that the lowest all-cause mortality is like under nine generally, right? Mm. And... I heard Peter Atia mention that as well under like just randomly. We already had this range, but he said he likes to see it under nine. Very few people have it under nine, by the way. Um, And mine is consistently around this until now I got it under nine by taking a lot of supplements. (laughs) So it's something that you have to uh, decide if if you want to do that. I don't know. We can check my genetics later. Maybe it's maybe I have the MTHFR or something, but um we can we can check right now actually so um i don't think you have the mthfr but what i can do is i'm just going to search for methylation c we do have a methylation report so you're typical in methylation 
It says mm. you have a tendency for lower betaine in your genetics. Gotcha. So methylation is complex. It could be like from many things. That you you have these you have a certain variance here in MTRR and MTHFD1. So those basically I would read those reports and see what the relevance is there, right? Mm. But mm. um essentially this one your your methylation seems fine. And let's see the MTHFR. It's typical. Mm. It, so the only thing that I would say with methylation is betaine. Gotcha. And again, th we have the report that looks at methylation in total. So actually your result, I would not, y it's actually typical for somebody who works out uh, every day, right? If, if you're very active, physically active, it's, it's quite typical. And the reason is because your yacht, your body uses a lot of methylation and I would say it's even more typical, especially if you're fighting infections, so your body uses methyl groups, when you're fighting infection and when you're working out. So mm -hmm. both of those things, I would, I would have been surprised if it was normal, actually like optimal, if you're not taking any supplements. Um, but you could check your previous result and upload all your previous results. I think and... it was last time as well, a bit like 11 or 12 as well. But... Yeah. So maybe it went up slightly because of the infection or whatever, um, you know, by a point, but still it's not optimal. And, yeah. Um and but that's to be expected. Like I would say that the, it's normal given given that that you're very physically active and and mm. given that you're not taking any supplements specifically for this. So you you mentioned that you cut down a lot of your supplements, uh which is good cuz you could see a lot of your baseline. You kind of want to see what's going on in the body when you're not taking a lot of supplements. Yeah. And now you can decide what makes sense to add. So you want to test these things. Like I wouldn't take vitamin A unless you came back lower, suboptimally lower a few times. So if mm. the, the previous result was also low, then I would uh, take vitamin. I would make sure you're getting more vitamin A. I don't, I wouldn't necessarily supplement, but you could do something very simple like eating more liver that would take care of the issue. Mm. Yeah. And with the, the homocysteine, I'm actually started to add like a B complex as well. I've never taken it like, before in my life but i'm gonna try it out and see the b complex like a good yeah a good b complex is gonna go a long way for um yeah the calcium is suboptimal here it's, it's a little high not out of the normal range but this could be because of the infection it's something you want to again this is why it makes sense to upload as many results as you have throughout the years and see, but it is known to go up during an infection. So nothing to worry about here. And by the way, we're going through the ones that are suboptimal first. Um, like I said, I've looked at all the results and you're definitely one of the healthiest people I've, I've seen. So uh, I don't want people to get a, a wrong view over here. <laughs> we're going through all the uh, suboptimal results first. Uh, like I said, everybody's going to have some suboptimal results. and um, you know, especially if you're not taking a lot of supplements, the alkaline phosphatase, you want to get this lower. And uh, again, check, there's a bunch of, you know, there's a couple ways you could get it lower, but you want to make sure that um, you check this again. You don't want to just start taking supplements unless you check something twice. And this could be related to the infection. It, it can go up from fighting an infection. The SHBG is actually pretty good. Um, it could be slightly lower, but you know, uh, it's it's actually pretty good. Um, I find that Chila Jeet brings it down. So you want to look at the history. If this is like, you know, the highest that you had, I would say that you're you're good. Uh, this is related to. I mean, all the ones that we're going through now are related to all cause mortality. So it's stuff you want to get in the optimal range. But in these cases, it's it's not very significant. Your LDH. Um, is is not bad uh basically i we but we both have the same ldh when, when i'm not taking too many supplements but what i find is that it's it's related to oxidative stress and especially and and also uh recovery it's not a bad so either somebody's working out or exercising a lot and then you produce lactate dehydrogenase uh, in response to that in response to muscle damage which is completely normal 
Uh, the issue becomes um, when, you know, so you want this under 200 because uh, it, it's kind of a marker of, it's not causal, but it's a marker of recovery. And it could go up during infections. It could go up any during any kind of oxidative stress. So you want to look at uh, the history and, and, and make sure that you're sometimes getting below 200. I found that... Um, Boron and N-acetylcysteine brought this down for me. So I was at like uh, around the same, to over 200. And I I went down to like 150 or something like that from taking N-acetylcysteine. And, and that's just related to, you know, some exercise and people who get COVID and long COVID. It's, it's kind of like it's elevated long term. Again, you, your numbers are pretty good. So nothing significant there. But then when we look at all the other results, uh, there's, you know, they're all very optimal. So um, your kidney function, your liver function, your thyroid, I mean, just overall, it's, it's your, even your phosphorus is optimal, which is usually not. Um, we can look at maybe the more, you know, clinically relevant markers, you know, the cholesterol and glucose and just for people to, yeah see what's yeah, the so, for those you know most kind of known famous markers yeah so uh your ldl is good um i i, I remember seeing that it was like 98 or something your apob is very good it was in the 70s so um these i mean uh, you know looking phosphorus is, is one that's not on people's radar and the optimal is is you know um up to 3.5 it's very hard to get it there actually because especially if you're eating a lot of animal, uh, like just a lot of protein, because phosphorus comes with protein, but um, which isn't a bad thing. You know, it's actually like there's protein is great for, you know, many, many reasons. But one of the negatives of a lot of protein is actually the phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, what you definitely like, that's one of the reasons why Coca-Cola is so bad and, and sodas because they <laughs> add phosphorus. <laughs> it's <Right>. like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you don't need more phosphorus if you got protein. Uh, interesting enough, your total protein was pretty good, even though your amino acids, some of them were quite low. So you can't always go through just the total protein. Um, checking the individual amino acids could also be relevant. Your GGT is very good. So that's 15. And uh, it's it's more or less dose dependent. I see a lot of people with higher levels. Your DHEA sulfate is pretty good. It's something that you could get a little higher if you wanted. We might change the optimal range here. Um, you know, again, this is it's also a marker that's related to recovery. So if you exercise, you're going to get it up. But if you exercise too much, it goes down. But I would say that it's still good. Um, you generally want it above 150 we have here, but maybe 175. I found that I... You know, my recovery was better when this was higher. So in general, um, but nothing, nothing to be worried about there. Uh, one of the amino acids that actually go up when you get sick is cysteine. So you see that you're normally at 20 and then it went to 56.67. And the reason is because your, your body wants to utilize cysteine in order to help fight the infection. But your uric acid is very good. Um, you know, you, you kind of want to look at a lot of uh, like, uh, yeah, th there's, I mean, we're, th th we, we measured, there's, you know, there's about 35 amino acids and then there's um, 181 blood markers that, that we're testing that, you know, we did it at the IWO program and um yeah, and then I found that those were all good except for, you know, the the ones that we discussed. But nothing nothing significant. We could show what the I will report looks like just quickly, and just so people could see all those markers. And here's that. But uh, yeah, I mean, like if we go through this here. 
your HbA1c is very good at 5%. So that means your blood sugar regulation is really good. Your fasting blood glucose is really good at 89.9. Your, um, again, I, I wouldn't trust all these, these, the ranges here are not up to date, like in terms of optimal. So I wouldn't look at these, but I'm just looking at the markers themselves. Your insulin is very good. So that's three, it's three, which means that you're very insulin sensitive. The GGT measures how much, you, you know, you can battle, like how good you are at oxidative stress. So it's like related to glutathione and, and that's very good. Um, and the, your liver markers, so the AST and ALT, um, I find that if somebody is obese, then the ALT is going to usually be related to fatty liver. If it's elevated in someone who's very fit, it's usually that they're not recovering as quickly or fast or as good enough. So you want this to be around. Um, you want this to be around uh, 26. You're kind of, yeah, uh, up to 30, I would say, even though the normal range is, is higher. Um, and your HDL is really good. That's also a measure of you know, like the oxidative stress balance in the body. Your triglycerides are very good. Measure it's going to help, you know, that's the fat in the blood. Helps with insulin sensitivity. Um, your leukocytes are very good at 4.59. You, you know, you don't want it above 6 really, even though the, the normal range is up to 11 because uh, that's going, like basically these leukocytes stick to your artery walls and your LPPLA2 is very good, which, you know, that that's related to, um, oxidative stress also in like, um, it's, it's going to be related to oxidized L LDL, ApoB. So all your cardiovascular markers are really good. You, you have low lipoprotein A. Uh, which is mostly, it's basically almost all genetic. But th so your your cardiovascular markers are very good, which means that you're very, very low risk for cardiovascular disease, which is going to be the number one killer. And um, yeah, and so it's very clear based on, you know, th these tests that you're metabolically very healthy. Your um, Your risk for heart disease is very low long term. Again, which is is going to be the biggest killer for, you know, fifty percent mm. of people die from heart disease. I would say that your lead could be lower. Mm -hmm. So, we have in the system up to ten. Um, yeah, up to ten essentially. So, you're a little higher than that, and I've once had fifty, and so it's something that you could change. Uh, you want to get, you know, in general, you want these uh, heavy metals to be lower, as yeah, low as possible. I had the chromium is uh, pretty elevated. Like, I don't take a chromium supplement or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, we were thinking of maybe we were using some sort of stainless steel cooking ware that has chromium or something. I wouldn't worry too much about that. I mean, it, it could be that you just ate some food with high, higher levels of chromium for a day. Mm. It is something you want to just check up, like right. check your history. Uh, the aluminum is fine. Strontium is is okay. You can get that a little higher. I I take a little bit of strontium, by the way, to get it higher. It's it's related to all cause mortality, so you want to have higher levels. It's yours isn't low, but it's like um, again, it's kind of. If you know it's related to all cause mortality, it's good for bone health. Uh, and your antimony, right? Everybody's got the high antimony. Yeah. Yours is probably a little higher than than the normal, but everybody's got like somewhat high. Um, nothing to worry about, but it actually could change based on different things. I actually take. Uh, I find spirulina and chlorella. Pretty good at getting down a lot of the toxins, actually. So the heavy metals and the toxins. Mm. Um, 
it's not bad and and the intimity as well so uh you already have low tin some sometimes people have higher levels of tin let's see your hormones pretty good your free testosterone your total testosterone your shbg um yeah so overall i would say like your hormones are 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 very good your ige is low so that shows you don't have an infection your copper and zinc are good magnesium is is good so that's pretty much nothing none of the urinary stuff um nice yeah so Sweet. like i said overall really good stuff i wanted to you know i, I want to talk about some of the good stuff uh, overall, your hemoglobin is good. You don't want it to be too high and too low. I'm not going to get into all the numbers for the exact optimal range. Your monocytes are really good. So um, having lower levels of monocytes uh, is absolute monocytes is is generally pretty good. So it, it comes up as flag because it's out of the normal range, but I have the same thing, and it's actually really good. Um, in the site, it, it wouldn't get flagged and self-decode um we have like 0 0.1 as the lower end because it really only shows up in very healthy people that they have out of the normal range so it's, it's one of those things that's out of the normal but it's not bad mm -hmm. and yeah so that's th that's your th those are your blood tests and um let's go back here There were a few, just a few lab markers that didn't upload properly, so I just uploaded it again. Uh, by the way, uh, I don't think it's here yet, but uh, yeah, uh, basically, if if you want to upload it, you just upload my labs, like we upload it for you, and you you would put that document in there. Um, so that's how I uploaded your results. By the way, mm -hmm. you could do it manually, but that takes time. This one is, uh, we do it for you, and. Yeah, so um, let's see what else we got here. Okay, now we can get to, right, we, we can get to the genetic stuff. Now, something to be aware of when we do the genetics, or just in general, we can start putting some things together. I could go through some genetic results. I actually like to go through the recommendations first and, uh, you know, do it based on that. But essentially, um, in your case, there's a couple factors that we want to look at. Number one is the genetic risks are much less relevant if you're young and you're very healthy. Because usually age is the biggest risk factor for most things, almost all, like all chronic diseases, right? And so if you're very young or, you know, if you're relatively young and you're very healthy, then it's just not going to be relevant. Like most of the, like if, even if you have a, you know, a higher likelihood of whatever, um, if you're able to be very healthy, then you're probably not going to get anything. So I still have the same genetic risks, but I don't have any of the problems anymore because I optimized my diet, lifestyle and supplements. So what I'm saying is, is that when we look at your genetics, um, you could see things that are you know, potential risks in the future, uh, you know, something like, okay, increased need for vitamin B12. So we could look at your vitamin B12 and see, you know, what the deal is there. Um, are you, are you, you're not taking any, uh, you weren't taking any B vitamins when you did the test, no. right? No, the, I guess the B12 was in the normal range, but yeah. yeah, that's if you take a supplement, like it, it could stay up elevated for a while. Also, if you're eating, like it's just not going to be as relevant for, um, you know, again, it, it's it's so when the body starts breaking down, these risks start to get more important. The other thing is, in this case, um, I don't know where the file is coming from. When we do the test, we have more quality and control when we upload uh, the file from our system and we get all the data. So we're not getting all the data when you have a text file, number one. And number two is 
We don't know the quality of the file itself. So there's uh, those two reasons that, you know, you want to make sure to get the test done with us, generally speaking. Now, we can filter by different types of, uh, these are the recommendations. This is where it comes together. And so like, let's say, do you want to look at dietary supplement or lifestyle recommendations? Um, let's look at supplements. Yeah, supplements are the most interesting for me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you could see how, let's say, uh, magnesium is related to a lab risk, right? You could see that magnesium is going to help with the higher cortisol. You could see how it's related to these genetic risks. And so we could go through some of these genetic risks. Uh, again, I don't think that they're going to... Um, I don't think they're they're going to manifest itself. Probably, because again, so if you're you know if you're very healthy, you're not going to have any problems. So it doesn't matter what your genetic risks are, <laughs> right? right? Um, but it's still an, an interesting to see the the tendencies. I mean, um, so one is here low mood. Uh, one is uh, anxiety. Again, I, I don't know what uh. This is just the these genetic risks. Um, and then we can look up all the... These are all the benefits of magnesium that you could see, all the things that's related to, but mm. it kind of just brings up the risks first. And you could click on each of these and see the references and what it does. So if you do have any anxiety or low mood in the future, magnesium would be a good thing. And, and you could see it helps with one of your goals of sleep quality. Mm -hmm. See, we click on sleep quality and we see that uh, it suppresses cortisol and improves sleep quality. So um, basically what it, the algorithm does is it takes all of the things that you inputted, goals, DNA risks. By the way, I uploaded the labs again. Like I said, some of them didn't make it make it in, but um, when, once they all get in here, there, then it'll take in more labs. The lifestyle risks is okay. You got no lifestyle risks related to this. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's magnesium. And so you can very, just very clearly see how would magnesium help you? This is ranked number one. And you could see what are the things that it's good for, how it helps certain labs. So, I mean, you tell me, do you take magnesium? Uh, Yeah. And and what does it help you with? So the the main reason I started taking I haven't had like any you know sleep issues, uh, anxiety or any of those things I haven't had. The reason I started taking it over the last six months or something is uh, because of the phosphorus. <laughs> so like my phosphorus oh, was like slightly on the higher end, <laughs> and uh, phosphorus reduces the magnesium absorption, and uh, the high phosphorus also appears to be more harmful to the kidneys if your magnesium is low so i just okay. yeah i just uh, you know doubled my magnesium intake pretty much i'm taking around maybe 500 to 1000 milligrams okay. of magnesium per day right now okay and so that's that and then ashwagandha comes up as number 2 for you mm -hmm. and by the way the, this listing is going to be different for everybody so everybody who looks at this it's also going to be different as soon as you input other data so if you have different data that you input, um, you know, the, the results are all like they're going to change. Maybe not drastically depending on what you input, but uh, yeah. So also there's different modes that you could use. There's biohacker mode and there's regular mode. The biohacker mode is going to give you more reports that you can see uh, that might not be as relevant. Um, so what, like I like to see it on biohacker mode, but... Um, yeah, and you could also either pick whether you want to include items with or without clinical trials. Hmm. So what do you want? You want, want to see only stuff with clinical trials? Yeah, that's, let's keep it going. Okay, that, that's, I, that's the default. And so I put it on biohacker mode and yeah. Wild and lists. so, yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of like uh, ashwagandha will help lower creatine kinase, which again is is important for recovery. It's not something we checked in the lab test. But you have a predisposition for higher levels. I'm curious what... It's not a bad thing. It's just... Um, yeah, I, I'm curious what your actual number is. 
It wasn't. It's, it's not in that normal. panel that we did it. I well, it's not in the IWO panel. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you could see how it's related to certain labs. So it's. Um, so it increased estradiol in in a study, and so mm -hmm. this is an example of like reduced cortisol, increased estradiol, and you know, and and so nudging these things in the in the right direction could be interesting. Bro, you've got like no lifestyle risks for things either. <laughs> no, I had hair loss. I think <laughs> <laughs> you got hair loss. I had like a whole bunch of lifestyle risks too. <laughs> like, wow, you got that. That's why you're not getting anything because you you got no lifestyle risks and and your labs are pretty good. And so that's what I'm saying is that your DNA, like if you think about it, everybody's going to be on a bell curve. You're going to get have higher risk for if we're checking 500 different things. You're going to have higher risk for certain things. But if you're optimally healthy, you won't be getting most of those things. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if they're not as common, like schizophrenia is pretty uncommon. So even if you're at a high genetic risk, the absolute risk is quite low. So it's nothing to worry about or even, you know, think about. Mm. And Plus I'm taking so much glycine that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it lowers the risk. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I wouldn't say it's it's not something that you have to worry about because, it, like I said, it's very uncommon. And if you're healthy, those two things go together. Like, you know, and, and maybe this is where the lifestyle risk would come in. Do you have family members? So, like, if there's no lifestyle risk, there's no, and you're you're healthy and like you're optimal, and there's no, and it's not a common thing. I actually think it might be a good idea to put this only in biohacker mode. Um, just because people don't necessarily know what to make of if they have a high risk for something that isn't right. very common, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but essentially, like even yeah, so we we take all the data into account, um, and you could see the ashwagandha will also help with power, exercise recovery. Hmm. So, uh, like I said, based on the LDH, it 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 could mean that you need more exercise recovery. So mm -hmm. you could see that a reducing creatine kinase, um, increased muscle strength. This is a placebo-controlled trial in 57 young men. And so you could like read that data and we give it an impact and evidence for each thing. And and by the way, the impact and evidence are all taken into account with the risks and the labs and all, everything. So it's all taken into account. But what we do is we don't want this to be a black box system. So we allow you to see different things, not necessarily like, you're not going to necessarily see the whole picture, but we allow you to see quite a lot. So you have two goals here, sleep quality and strength, and ashwagandha helps with those two things. Nice. Right? And yeah. you have a genetic predisposition for lower power. I don't, but if you're working out a lot, it, you know, if you're exercising and you're fit and you're healthy, it's not going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I haven't taken ashwagandha, but yeah, I can experiment with it. And my recommendation is the Shodan or the Sensoral. Mm. You want to get um not the, the case. I got the Iowa one. What, what, what? Which one is that? That's the Shodan. Okay, good. By the way, you can click here and see what studies were specifically done on Shodan. Gotcha. And Sensoral, so it's like. Which ones are meaning? Which ones are specifically good for specific things? Um, I personally like my testosterone a little higher, even though yours is in the optimal range. Like yours is almost seven hundred, I think, right? Which is which is very good. But I kind of like it a little bit higher for my like. Just you know, I don't. I'm not going to take it, but uh, if I'm that level, but I, I kind of like like to nudge it a, a little higher. And ashwagandha is actually one of those things that can help increase testosterone, as you could see here. Nice. Let's see what the study is. So this is done in, yeah, there's a few studies. Increased testosterone in in men stimulates the production of luteinizing hormone. Uh, so uh, that's, you know, interesting. Lowers cortisol, improves sleep quality. So you could see why it comes up because... It's, you know, you didn't put in that many goals or, and you don't have any, I don't think you put in any symptoms and conditions um, where I, I think most people 
will have multiple that they'll put in. But in your case, you could see that sleep quality, strength, these are goals. It's helping with these and it's helping with certain genetic risks. Um, vitamin C comes up. So this is going to be interesting. You see it comes up for the hydroxylysine and cortisol apparently it helps with. Interesting, didn't know that. Um, and then certain other things here. It says lower genetic tendency for lower sperm count. You could check your sperm count. Mm. But again, I don't, you know, being healthy is going to overcome all these genetic tendencies, like being optimal, not just, you know, generally, oh, I feel good. Like actually being optimal like yourself is going to overcome a lot of these genetic tendencies, but they're still interesting to see. Um, like, yeah, I mean, I, I would personally, if I were you, I would get another test. I would get our test just to make sure yeah, the things are, are more accurate because you, you don't want like, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So you want to make sure. But I mean, you could see certain things like very clearly, like sleep quality, strength, um, the lab risks, like that stuff is is very clear. What do you think about the whole body, uh, whole genome sequencing? Um, it's good. I don't think it's necessary. Just, I, I don't, I, I think it's be, just because the, um, the, you know, I, I don't, unless you really have like some weird problems, I don't think it's necessary at this stage. Right. It's more expensive and it's not really going to give you much better results. It's like, yeah. you know, because we could get all the important variants, like almost all of them with uh, genotyping. Mm. Now, it's it's more important if you... Yeah, and also I'll tell you a problem. A lot of these whole genome stuff are garbage. Like the quality is garbage. So, um, th this, yeah. Is it the it, technology it, or is it the companies or... It's the companies. It's the software after that. So... Uh, you know, also sometimes it's like if they're using BGI, like you want to like the Illumina, you want to use Illumina, but the BGI is cheaper. So companies are using the the Chinese machines <laughs> and then <laughs> and then the software after that is not 100 percent. And um, so we've seen that there's a lot of garbage out there, not saying everyone, but there's a lot of garbage. And so, you know, for ninety nine bucks, it just makes sense to do genotyping and even if you get a whole genome sequencing like you know it, it's just you i have both personally I, I haven't found any use for the whole genome yet mm. um because it really is all related to the software and there's there's no good software the only thing is that if you're if you got some like weird unexplainable problem that right. you know you got some rare mutation or whatever you clearly don't have any of that or you wouldn't, you know, you would have something seriously wrong with you. Um, so for a guy like you, I think just uh, genotyping is makes sense. And for most people, really, the vast majority. All right. Um, Only the unicorns, yeah. special. Yeah, yeah. For somebody just like unexplainable, you know, whatever, you know, then you want to really see like the rare variants. And then even then, you're not going to be able to see what's like, it's it, the software isn't, it's really the software that rather than just getting everything done. Yeah. Um, if you, so DHEA shows that it'll help lower cortisol and yeah, the, the DHEA to cortisol ratio is interesting. It's something you want to look into. So your DHEA was slightly on the lower end. Your cortisol was slightly on the higher end. Again, let's look, we, we need to look at the history. The estradiol again, slightly lower if you wanted to raise it. Um, I personally like it, you know, between 30 and 50 because I'm more interested in cardiovascular disease. Again, there's certain negatives like it's, you know, in terms of the you want a decent you want a good estradiol to testosterone ratio. Right. So if your estradiol is on the higher end, you also want your testosterone to be a little higher. So for me, I like my testosterone around 850. Um, or 900 and my estradiol somewhere between 30 and 50. And and that's where it is, right? Uh, that's where it is now. My testosterone is around 900. 
and uh yeah and, and when i don't take supplements it goes down so it goes down to like 550 600 mm. yeah so the, the supplements bring it up by like 50 percent. probably goes down to, yeah i would say at least probably like 50 percent. it's it's a it's a good increase yeah. um and it's not even that many supplements but it's like mainly boron tonkat ali things like that and some ashwagandha and I actually found I'm pretty sure carnitine also there's a study on it, but I'm I, I'm like I noticed it raises mine as well. Rhodiola, good for strength. It's gonna help cortisol. Um, you you really don't have any lifestyle <laughs> for any of them. Yeah, I didn't know what to put in the symptom. <laughs> or the I, yeah, I didn't get most people symptoms. are gonna have lifestyle risks. So. You know, there's going to be, and you don't have that many goals. What that means is you don't need to take that many supplements, right? Right. For me, I need to take a lot more because I've got way more, I had way more issues and more labs were out of the optimal range. Like if I don't supplement, I'm much worse. I'm significantly worse than you are without supplementing as a baseline. Right. So again, it's it's very personalized. Like I'm not going to tell everybody to do, take as many supplements as me. And you clearly don't need to take that many, but you know, taking a couple here and there could be very interesting. Mm. Um, the phosphatyl serine is that it's coming up because of the cortisol. But yeah, I mean, if I were you, I would kind of just experiment with uh, these five supplements, see how you do. Gotcha. Right, the magnesium, ashwagandha, vitamin C, DHEA, rhodiola, and and, and see if it you know, if it helps you with your goals or your lab tests. But um, yeah, and also uh, you're going to see more lab tests pop in the system. I, I just, like, a, as it uploaded, it, for some reason only it was like 130 that got uploaded, whereas it should be like 180. Nice. Um, yeah, and then you could, basically the way to look at your genetic risks is just to look at things and see what is interesting for you. Um, I recommend people look at it through the recommendations because there you see what to do first <laughs> and then you can see what you're at risk for. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like some people freak out and it's like something that people have to realize is that everybody's got genetic risks. It's just, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the, and that, the, no the perfect, question is... Perfect genome. It, yeah, and it's not even possible you don't just because, um, you know, again, people evolved to, like, there's no bad, you know, there's no, nobody's, like, most people don't have bad genes. It's just that you evolved in a certain environment and you have different strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes the strengths and weaknesses, you know, are, are antagonistic, like, you know what I'm saying? Like they're they're, mm. they're kind of if you're stronger in one place, you might be weaker in another. Like maybe if you're if you got more muscle mass, you have lower VO2 max in in a certain sense, right? Like uh, because you got more weight to carry, right? So there's no right answer of oh I should have you know it's it's really you know it depends on there's there's a balance to these things, but um you know, everybody's at risk for a bunch of different things. And with epigenetics and the environment, the lifestyle, the, the things that you're doing, the idea is that you can prevent these things, right? So yeah. you can be optimally healthy and there there's nothing to, um, yeah. So like, let's say it says you're more likely for psychological trauma. If you had a pretty good upbringing mm -hmm. and, and there was no serious, you know, stressful, like there was no, so yeah. And, and also in, again, optimal health is going to have a big factor here. You know, it, it probably is not going to be relevant, right? Right. Certain things are like, okay, if you're more likely for a concussion, if you don't hit your head, you're not going to get a concussion. <laughs> you <know? laughs> if you're taking a lot of, you know, antioxidants and you have good oxidative balance in the body, lower sperm count might not be, it's probably not going to be an issue. So what you have to see is like, what is the risks that are, related to you that are relevant, right? And then there's a bunch of recommendations. I like to, you know, look at this, the recommendations first, and that puts it all together with the labs and with the DNA and with, with your goals. 
and you could see just the big picture. Okay. It gives you a bunch of ideas of what to do and why. And so I would say like, you know, looking at your results, there's like uh very few stuff because of how healthy you are, but even no matter how healthy you could still get like, you know, these, these top five tips here. And then you yeah. could do, you know, you could do lifestyle stuff. Let's see the lifestyle. I mean, aerobic exercise is always going to come up as top three, just because it is Powerful. the best thing for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> We're actually going to implement something that um basically like allows like we're gonna hide certain recommendations if you already say that you do a lot of aerobic exercise right because then it's not relevant but it, we always go back and forth about it because um you know the, the algorithm automatically will prioritize things and it, and it makes sense that aerobic exercise like if aerobic exercise wasn't coming up as in the top five, you would think there's something wrong with the algorithm. <laughs> yeah. Right. So the idea is that we kind of want to show people how aerobic exercise would benefit them, what labs it's benefiting. And so you could see that, right? Mm. I guess you can put like a, like the saying as the clinical or biohacker mode that turn this on to see what you're already doing that would help your situation and what you're not doing right now. Right, right. So that's kind of things that we're we're exploring. Uh, you know, it's just a little complex because you know, like like you said, it, it, we we don't want to create more toggles necessarily. Uh, but yeah, like you know, on the one hand, people don't want to see generic rec like things that they consider generic, which is going to be the most impactful things based on a lot of you know all the information. On the other hand, uh, you know, they want to see, okay, if I'm already exercising, I want to see how it's good for me, right? And if I'm doing aerobic exercise and I want to see what it's good for. So, I mean, for me personally and for you, I think the supplements is <laughs> is more interesting because yeah. <laughs> we're already doing all the lifestyle stuff and I don't feel like we need motivation to, to you know, I mean, it could, it's still interesting sometimes I look at it, but I really look at... Uh, and I see what the number is to see where it's ranked. So if something's right. ranked five, that's very interesting. And and people who are looking at this, when they upload their stuff, uh, there's going to be a very different order to to these things, mm. actually. Yeah. Um, um, and so, yeah. Yeah. I guess we can, at least on my dashboard, I can see that my optimal diet is the Mediterranean diet. Um which I probably agree with. <laughs> what are, are there like any other like, like what's your optimal workout or something like that? Uh, so there's, I mean, so in the lifestyle stuff, there's going to be, yeah, there's going to be different workouts, right? And they're just going to be ranked based on how impactful they are to your health. So yoga is number five for you. And you could see one of the reasons it, it helps with cortisol and homocysteine. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons it's coming up, it seems like. It, it's helping with certain genetic risks, too. Again, if you don't injure your back, you're not going to have a low back injury. So a lot of these things are not going to be relevant unless you, you have that trigger. Right. Um, and meditation is, comes up for number six, right? And so progressive muscle relaxation. As you go down, it gets less and less uh, generic. Right. Regular sleep schedule, chewing, <laughs> mm -hmm. aromatherapy, Iyengar yoga, right? So that's like specific things. You could see that Iyengar yoga, let's see, it, it helps with sleep quality. And what else does it do? It helps with strength, apparently. Yeah, it's like practicing a, static yeah. causes, I think. Yeah, so practicing Iyengar yoga for 8 to 16 weeks improves strength, balance, active range of motion, physical well-being, aspects of mental well-being. So we do give specific things. I think, yeah, I mean, it could be interesting. Like you could try out Iyengar yoga, but I feel like you already have your cold exposure is number 21. Sometimes it helps to just put things into perspective. You know what I'm saying? Like you could yeah. see where things come up. So it's like, okay, which is going to help with cortisol here and sleep quality. Those are the two things 
that uh, that it, that it shows help with. And chair yoga. I mean, there's 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 a lot of lifestyle stuff that you could go go down and and pick, and and I think it'll be interesting. So I just want to show you that the recommendations are different for each person. We're going to go through, just to make it a little simple, we'll go through one of them. The supplement category, you get magnesium, ashwagandha, vitamin C, DHEA, and rhodiola. Okay? So remember those. I'm looking at mine right now. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll show my screen just so people can understand how it's actually different. And if you've ever... Um, if you've ever seen any kind of, have you taken any kind of test and they gave you recommendations based on the test? Um, what kind of test? Like blood test or? Anything. Like the problem with these things of taking a test and then getting a recommendation is usually unidimensional. Whereas mm. you want as much data. You don't want to take something for one reason, right? right. You're like, okay, I'm going to take magnesium for this and I'm going to take this for that and you generally want as many reasons as possible. So uh, this is my list, actually. If you remember, so magnesium does come up as top five. We have that in common. Yours is number one. Mine is number three. And ashwagandha for you comes up as number two, comes up for four. The rest of them are different. I get zinc, vitamin D, and you see, I got a lot more genetic risks than you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can see mine, homocysteine, methylation, mood. For these, I've actually had them, they do, they had expressed in the past. And and I have a higher need for zinc, uh, telomere length, MTHFR. So you can see a lot of things, acne, a lot of these things expressed in the past. And, you know, it's, it's very important. For, like zinc actually helped me quite a lot. So, um, and you could see like, my goals and is a lot more i have a lot more goals than than you <laughs> more symptoms conditions goals uh mostly goals right and and i guess i put certain things that i used to have that i don't have anymore just because i want to make sure like I, i'm i'm i want to make sure like I, i'm curious to see what the algorithm would have recommended you know when i had these issues so you could see that zinc was good for low mood for me, you know, I got a goal for memory, sleep onset, sleep quality, testosterone. And uh yeah, and so you could see all these things and I, and like you could click on each of these things and see in, in this case I have a specific variant that makes it more likely to uh do well with zinc here for this specific thing. And my labs, I mean, I have a lot more labs uploaded cuz I upload, yeah, I First of all, yeah, I make I make sure like every single lab is uploaded. Um, my glucose higher fasting. I do have higher fasting glucose. I I'm not sure why, but because uh, my HPA one C is good, but um, it just went up very slightly to five point four percent, mainly when I was fighting an infection. And again, some of these things got out of the optimal as a result of the infection, actually. Mm. Um. That's why, and then you could see all the things that it's helped me in the past. I was suboptimal in a bunch of different labs, and now I'm optimal, right? At some point, right. like I said, my lead was higher, estradiol was suboptimal, HSCRP was suboptimal. Like I was a wreck. So you could see all these things that it was helping with. And then I have more lifestyle risks here, uh, like ADHD. Um, so yeah, you could see the whole picture very clearly. And because we have different risks, different goals, different labs, and different lifestyle risks, and different genetic variants as well, it makes sense that my recommendations are going to be different than yours. Your zinc is number 13, mine is one, right? Yeah. So that's why it's very important to, and, and for a guy like you, I'd be like, look, focus on the top five. You don't need to take that many supplements, right? And just see how things change in your blood and different things. But that's why it's important to, you know, understand what, what you need to do. What are the priorities? What's number one, two, three, right? Instead, people are just like randomly taking stuff 
because somebody says, oh, you've got acne, then take zinc. Okay. Well, they're not checking their zinc in their blood. Right. And that's only, that's one dimension. They're saying, okay, you got this, then do that. Whereas look at how many dimensions we're doing. We're doing the genetic risk, the labs, yeah. the symptoms, conditions. That's why I wanted you to fill in as much as possible with the lifestyle risks and the labs, because the more data you input, the better the results are going to be. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I mean, I've looked around a lot for, for, for the cell to code dashboard now. And yeah, it's, it's really cool to see like the, because you know, you, you would want to have a dashboard for your health kind of that looks at like all the things, the labs and the lifestyle risk and the genetics and uh, the other things. So yeah, it's definitely like, well, well worth to kind of have like a dashboard that takes the like, you know, analysis out of it, or you don't have to start analyzing everything. You don't have to start reading all the studies the uh, program uh, already does it for you the, the you know the analysis absolutely yeah exactly so i really think that the you know the future is you know you, you need people educating you need sometimes people to help uh like lead people through the results cuz sometimes it can be a little complex but at the end of the day you do need software to help you right and mm. so there's like you, know, you you need you, you need educators always to help people understand different things but to kind of put a lot of things together everybody you know you, you kind of need like there's no one size fits all right yeah that's true um so yeah i think that's a good place to wrap it up where can people learn more about you and your work so they could uh uh, they could go to selfdecode.com. That's that's the software that we use for all this stuff. And then for me, they could go to Mr. Biohacker. They could follow me there. On Instagram. And on Instagram, yeah. So Mr. Biohacker on Instagram. I do have a podcast as well. So they could check that out. Uh, and the that's the Joe Cohen Show. Sounds good. And yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess this is what I do. My My main thing is... Uh, you know, precision health, supplements, genetics, how all these things kind of combine uh, and then what you should do, be doing based on that. Mm. So it's just, you know, like what you're doing is very smart. You're taking a lot of tests and you're not guessing now what you need, right? You're, you're, you're actually looking at it in the blood and the more tests you take, the better understanding you're going to get, right? If you take yeah. a vitamin A test, three times if you take it once is that because you're fighting the infection so that's why it's it's important to upload as many results as possible yeah i agree uh so yeah it was great talking with you i guess we'll see each other next in india for the next retreat but uh yeah in the meanwhile people can check out your podcast and uh definitely check out yourself to code as well awesome yeah appreciate you having me on all right i'll see you around Alright, that's it for this episode. Check out selfdecode.com and use the code SEAM for a 10% discount.